Welcome to the global phenomenon, Surviving the Survivor, where we bring you the best guests in all of true crime. This is a STS special, Surviving My Biggest Case. Here's your host, Emmy Award-winning journalist, Joel Waldman. What's up, STS Nation? Welcome to another episode of Surviving the Survivor, the podcast that promises to bring you the very best guests in all of true crime. And this is an STS special, Surviving My Biggest Case, with a special person. That's because I love her. Her name is Monica Jordan. She is president of Jordan Research and Consulting, one of the nation's most sought-after private investigators. She's handled more than 50 death penalty trials, and she worked uh, on the notorious female serial killer case of Eileen Warnos on her post conviction team. Monica, although she's not an attorney, is a private investigator. She knows more than most attorneys. Monica, welcome to Surviving My Biggest Case. I'm excited to hear this. You texted me. You said this one has it all. Sex, drugs, violence. I don't know exactly what you said, but anyway, uh, tell us um, what's this case? When's it, what's it take back to? How'd you get involved? So this case was the state of Florida versus Michael Mordente. I got involved in 1995. He had already been convicted in 1989 and had been on death row for six years and had just been affirmed on direct appeal. This is a murder for hire case and, uh, it involves an ex-wife who was having an affair with a man by the name of Larry Royston. Larry Royston was trying to divorce his wife, Thelma Royston, but she knew where all the bodies were buried in their air conditioning business. So she was going to take them. I mean, rightfully so, what, was it, what she was entitled to in a divorce. So in all of his outside of marriage relationships, he starts trying to find a, a solicit somebody to commit a murder to kill her. And uh, he succeeds. And Thelma Royston is killed in 1989 in their horse barn. They had this beautiful horse barn in Odessa, Florida, which is outside of Tampa. And they were um, show horses. So you keep the lights on to a certain time to so their hair doesn't grow in you know, and it keeps their coats real shiny and, and all of that stuff. So she'd left the, the lights on in the barn. So she was going out at about 10 o'clock that night to turn the lights off in the barn. And her mom was going with her. Her, her mom was older. And um, she said, oh, mom, somebody's down at the gate wanting to look at one of Larry's horses he had for sale. I'll, I'll be back in a little while. So. That was the last time Thelma Royston was seen alive. She's found, the mother comes out a little bit later seeing that the barn lights are on and goes out there and Thelma's collapsed in the barn with multiple gunshot wounds and multiple stab wounds. No defensive wounds, nothing. So um, so just so I get it straight, is Michael the spouse, Michael Moore dead? No, he's... He, Thel uh, Larry Royston is the spouse of Thelma. Michael oh. Mordente is the ex-husband of Gail Mordente, who is one of the ones screwing Larry Royston. Okay. Wow. So this, is already, this is a lot already. A lot going on. Okay. Yeah. So, so anyways, so a girlfriend of... Larry Royston's comes forward about um, maybe like eight months to a year later and says, Hey, uh, I just heard, I just came back. I've been in the military. I just came back. I heard that Thelma Royston was killed. And um, I just want to let you know, I was having an affair with Larry Royston. And when I was having an affair with him, he asked me to kill his wife. So now that gives law enforcement the lead to look at Larry Royston. They pull his cell phone records. They see that he's always talking to this Gail Mordente. So in 1990, they, they raid her house. She gets in the car and Gail goes, oh, my God, I'll tell you everything I know. Give me immunity. And then it was off to the races. And she, and she tells them, my ex-husband did it. 
And that is the only link Michael Mordente has to this terrible, terrible murder of Thelma Royston. So that was Michael. I'm so confused. So that was Michael Mordente's wife or ex-wife who basically blows the whistle on him. But, but, but why? That's where I'm confused. She says he did it. I'm lost. She's having an affair. She's having an affair with the husband of the dead lady. Oh, the dead. I got you. Okay. So okay. she's been going around. She thinks she has landed herself. That's somebody. Gail. That's Gail. Yeah. Okay. Right. Okay. So she thinks she has landed herself somebody and she's going to help him kill his wife. So maybe she can be the next Mrs. Royston. So she's going around to all of these. Mm. Gail Mordente and Mike Mordente were in the car business. And uh, although they were divorced, they would still run in the same circles, car auctions and all that stuff. Mm -hmm. So Gail go starts going around to these auctions asking people to, to find somebody to kill this woman. And she off, off the cuff, she's talking to Michael Mordente about it because they're still amicable. And he and he goes for how much money? And I think it's like ten thousand, seventeen thousand, something. And Mike off the cuff goes, "Oh shit, for that kind of money, I'll do it." Mm. Not thinking that this would ever come to this. So just a little bit of context about Michael Mordente. He was a successful businessman. Wow. He owned a car dealership. He had a pilot's license. Um, he was like a real person, not not like some of these cases I get where they're just drug deals gone bad and somebody gets killed. I mean, this is like a real business person in Tampa. Mm -hmm. And so yep. now we're going back like, I don't know, 35 years here. Right. Uh, right. Something along those lines. So you get and you get called in as a private inv investigator at what point after at Michael the Morgan time? At the time I was working for a state agency that represented all death row inmates in Florida. Okay. So in Florida, our constitution says if you want to be able to execute somebody, they have to have legal representation. So it's the best way to look at it is it's like a public defender's office for people that have already been convicted of murder. And so they handle all the post conviction appeals of these clients. So I had waived my admission to law school and taken this job with this state agency. And Michael Mordente was one of the very first cases I had. I was 20, 22 years old, 23 years old. I mean, right out of college. <laughs> and I, uh, and they, <laughs> excuse me, they handed me this case and I read the, I read the trial transcript and I went and met uh, Michael Mordente for the first time on death row. And um, that started a, a friendship and a business, a business relation, or, you know, like a professional relationship for the next, you know, till 2008 when he walked out. Wow. All right. So, so let me just make sure I have the players. The guy on death row is Michael Mordente. Yes. His wife at the time, Gail, is that it, was his ex-wife at the time. His, they were already divorced, time. right? He's screwing this other guy, Larry Royston. Royston to use your yes. words. Larry is married to Thelma. Thelma is the one with the show horses. Larry wants Thelma gone in a murder yes. for hire. Yes. Gail says, I can help you out, and goes to her ex-husband, who's this Michael A bunch Morgan. of other people. She goes to all kinds of people, but okay. she goes to Michael Mordente as well. So we're at the now she this uh Thelma one day because they leave the lights on so horses hair can grow you learn something new every day I would never know that until unless I asked you or you told me that I would have no clue so she goes to turn the lights on off lake they leave the lights on to let the horses hair grow she never comes back she's dead it, prevent, it prevents the horses hair from growing because they think it's sunlight longer oh well there you go um yeah. and that's the last we ever see of Larry Royston's wife. Thelma, why can't guys just get divorced? What's going on here? Well, he and didn't want to lose the assets. So it gets, it gets, the story gets crazier. Okay. So, so tell me. So, um, Gail, Gail drags Mordente into this. 
They're both convict. They're both going to trial. Larry Royston and Michael Mordente. Gail Gail has use immunity, which is as long as you tell the truth and you don't deviate, we're not going to prosecute you. There's a there was a big big to do in this case between transactional and use immunity, but I won't bore you with that. Well, we saw we saw a use with uh, Wendy Adelson just at Charlie's trial uh, with use. Right. Immunity. So now, if they. Go ahead. No, what year is this trial? So are we, is this like 89, early? Uh, 90, 90. So that, so okay. they're going, so then the night before Larry Royston's trial is to convene, he commits suicide. Wow. How does he do it? Uh, pills, pills and some liquor. Wow. Okay. So Larry's out of the picture now. So, so now Larry's we- out. Larry's out. And so because, um, Michael was up some means. He went to Barry Cohen, who was at the time the most sought after defense attorney in Florida. I mean, that guy was, I mean, that guy was it. And he was in Tampa. And so he was going to charge Mike about 250 grand. And so Mike had some land and he had a little of this and a little bit of that, but he never could quite get, get, a, get enough up. So Barry, Barry Cohen did start the case and the investigation and all of that stuff, but uh, Mike started running out of money and there was a rich chiropractor that had run over a bunch of kids in a lake and that chiropractor was going to get charged with all of these deaths. And so Barry kind of dropped Mike as a client because he couldn't come up with the rest of the money and took this fancy chiropractor's case. So Mike's now without a lawyer. So Mike goes back to his bail bondsman and says, man, I don't have a lawyer. Barry's dropped me. I'm out of money. I've got a little bit of land. And the bondsman says, Oh, I know this guy, John Addy, John, John Addy's a lawyer. He'll help you. Well, John Addy's never done a capital murder case before where they're seeking death. And he was so ineffective, not only in this case, but in several other cases, that he now, well, the last time I knew he was selling siding for Sears and he was had been disbarred. Mm. So quite, quite the fall. Yeah. So Mike had gone from having the absolute best to I mean, Mike, Mike would have been better off with the public defender's office. Mm. And not only did he have this lawyer that was way outside of his depth, but he had the two best known husband, wife prosecutors in the area, Nick and Karen Cox. They were, they were it. They were Mm. law and order. They were, Mm. they were it. And they were no joke. And now what is your, like, what is, your task here what is your role as a private you're working for michael here i assume for michael's yes. team and what are you supposed to be doing finding evidence that he did not commit this crime i guess yeah so in a, in the in in that role when i had that job we started we went back to the trial and we look at everything everything uh, uh, like with a fine tooth comb under a microscope to see newly discovered evidence anything that you have that can, you know, undo, undo this injustice. So the first time I met Michael Mordente, I walk in, you know, you know, death row is kind of a, you know, it's just an intimidating place. I mean, it smells, it's, it's, um, it's death row. And so when they brought Michael into me, he is this, I don't know, 56 year old man, uh, kind of small Italian guy. Mm -hmm. And he just starts screaming at me. (laughs) I mean, I was like, Jesus. Hold on. I got to take a step back. So when you go, where is the state prison? Is it North Florida? Yeah. Death row is at, well, there's two death rows. One's Florida state prison. And right across the ditch is Union Correctional Institution. And they house some guys at Florida State Prison and some at Union Correctional. Michael was at Union Correctional in Rayford, Florida. When you go, what's it like for you when you go to state prison? Forget Michael Moradente. I want to hear this. You go in, you obviously, you got to leave all your stuff at the front door. 
you go through a million gates. Are you getting, uh, I mean, Monica, it's no, uh, you know, you're an attractive woman. Are you getting cat called the minute you're in that prison? What's going on in there? How's that? No, um, no. In, in a situation like that, in regular state prison, I mean, I have had some situations in other states where the protocols are a little different and I have to walk past um, some of the residents or, you know, prisoners, whatever you want to call them, which can be, you know, a little uncomfortable and i've had some do some uncomfortable things no, nothing like you know silence of the land with jody foster but you're just like really man can you put that back in your pants that's kind of embarrassing um so, but you you know the more they're like children the more attention you give it the worse it the worse the behavior is so i'm yes wow uh now i'm fascinated by that so when you when you go to visit everyone knows my fascination with prisons but when you go to visit michael mordente he is brought to you, I guess, in a in some yeah. Sort so of I'm room. seated in uh, the attorney the attorney uh, room, and mm. he's brought to me at there at the time they used to just be handcuffed. Now they're waist chained and shackled, and mm. you know, so they can't move anywhere. Um, and he was just loud. What, what's and he yelling he, at you? I'm innocent. Get me the fuck out of here. I didn't do this. I'm innocent. Why did they send me this child? You know, I mean, he he was very animated. Yeah. And you're you are 22 or something and you yeah, look like 25 22. now. So I can't imagine what you look like back then. I would have probably been pissed off, too. I would have been. He was he just. um I would have said, why'd they send me the intern? But anyway. Yeah, no, that's pretty, like, why did they send me the stupid one? You know, and so um, that's how our relationship started. But mm. once I never in any situation, I never go and see a client until I've read everything I can on the case, because if I'm going to start a relationship, uh, you know, a trusting professional relationship with somebody, uh, this is their life. And I think that it's in really poor taste and very disingenuous to try and go in there and bluff about something that they're living mm -hmm. and be like, Oh yeah, I read that knowing full. Well, like, so I try and really know as much as I can. So right out of the gate, I was able to say, Hey, these are some really important issues that I think, you know, we should talk about. And then after that, he started kind of calming down and we had a good conversation. Um, but for, all the, the, for the 13 years, I think it was 13 years that I was involved in that case before he walked out. Um, every communication started with him screaming at me. Every, every time. Sounds like it my got, mom. It, no, but like, I will tell you in, in that case, and I think that probably statute of limitations has run on this, but it got so bad that I could, even when I'd have to go and tell him stuff, he wouldn't, he wouldn't stop screaming about his innocence. Get me out of here. I'm innocent. This, this is a, an, an injustice that I, I smuggled bit of honey, you know, the little candies bit of honey. Yeah. 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 I would smuggle them in my work bag or in a file. Mm. And, um, I would just kind of gently unwrap them and push it across the table and he could put it in his mouth. And once you get that shit in your mouth, it's like taffy. Yeah. You yeah. can't feel it. <laughs> so I could like tell him everything I needed to tell him about the case. And then by, and you only have a certain amount of time with them. So the guards would come by and knock on the window and be like, you have five minutes. And I'd be like, Oh, we only got five minutes. And the whole time he had been chewing the candy. So. Wow. Now that's a smart move. That's something only a, a smart woman could come up with. No <laughs> well, guy I'm sure, that. I'm sure the prison's going to crucify me for that. That's all yeah. I ever smuggled in was a piece of candy. Yeah. My wife probably will have a bit of honey when I get home tonight. Um, so what did he tell you? This is really what happened. I'm innocent. I didn't do this. Did he have a story for you? Like an alternate story? He had an alibi. Okay. He had an alibi. And the thing that was so messed up about this case is that like every, it was the perfect storm. Everything that could go wrong would go wrong. Uh, mm -hmm. So they half-ass presented the alibi. So there, he has a girlfriend. Mm -hmm. 
They have sex under a, 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 a overpass in the car on the way back from the auction. They stop at Shoney's. It's spaghetti night at Shoney's. The girlfriend's arms in a sling because she had had surgery. A year into the before it went to trial, the girlfriend went back to the Shoney's and found the waitress that worked that night. And so the the state being very like this, Karen Cox was no joke. She really, you know, she annihilated these witnesses. She goes, oh, it wasn't until a year after, you know, the right. murder that the girlfriend of the defendant came and found you. Well, and sure enough, the waitress wasn't supposed to work that night. She wasn't on the schedule. So she didn't clock in. So it looked all very fabricated. But it was just like the worst of circumstances. Yeah. Well, now, Thelma, did you say she was shot or how was she killed? Shot and stabbed. Shot and stabbed. So did, was there ever any direct evidence linked back to Michael Mordente? No. And then, then you had a snitch that Karen Cox... The, the story was that Karen Cox did favors for this snitch. He was a federal inmate that was a bank robber. His name was Horace Barnes. I think he's out of prison now. Horace Barnes took a car with his girlfriend, Tracy Leslie, on a on a test drive from Michael Mordente's car dealership. And they used that car in a federal bank robbery. Hmm. So FBI agent Barry Carmody tracks the car back to Michael Mordente's lot and Mike says, oh, that's Tracy Leslie. She's like this, you know, kind of like this lot lizard that kind of hangs out in the area. And her and her boyfriend had this car. Uh, and that, that's where the car comes from. So Mordente had to testify for the feds in the bank robbery case. So this is about a couple of years before the murder. So when Horace Barnes is in federal prison and learns that Mordente is caught up in this thing, he's like, oh, oh, yeah, I know Mike Mordente. He's in the mob and he he confessed to me mm -hmm. um, that he killed Thelma Royston. Oh, boy. So I'm still really, really young when mm -hmm. this uh, when they decided the lawyer, the lead lawyers on this case were, was Marty McLean, who was, uh, he just, he passed recently, probably one of the smartest lawyers I've ever worked with and trained under, and just a, just a great, just a great advocate for these things. Mm -hmm. And Terry Bacchus, who's now retired from the feds, she's phenomenal too. And they're like, hey, you're going to Leavenworth to go see Horace Barnes. And let's get to the bottom of this. So off I go, because I know Michael's version is, you know, I know Horace Barnes because he stole, you know, basically stole a car of mine and committed a bank robbery in it. And he's <laughs> mad at me because I testified against him. So off to Leavenworth I go. Mm. And I'm going to tell you, le th this case is so important to me because it, it, it it's like a coming of age. Mm -hmm. And it's also, it was pre-marriage, pre-children. I was so young and it was just such a, just a, such a, a ride, such, such a ride. Yeah. So I get to Leavenworth and I don't know if you've ever seen a picture of um, USP, it's United States Penitentiary, Leavenworth, Kansas, but it's this huge imposing white building with a set of stairs leading up to it that looks like a ladder. I mean, it's steps, but it looks like you go straight up. <clears throat> <laughs> like you're walking to heaven. Um, and so I got there anyway. So they bring Horace Barnes to me in the visiting park. And what you have to understand is in federal visiting parks, um, you see all of these other people that are visiting, whether it be family members, lawyers, whatever. And I, I had the, I guess, fortune of actually seeing Leonard Peltier, who was the native American, advocate that had um been in a shootout with some u.s marshals 
Um, so I was like, so I'm sitting there in the visiting part. I'm like, oh my gosh, I think that's Leonard Peltier. That's that's pretty fascinating. Um, and so I sit there. So they bring Horace Barnes to me, and I sit with Horace Barnes, and for about three hours, he continues to tell me how guilty my client is, mm. and that Mike was the killer, and that Mike told him he killed this woman. And he went through this whole thing and I was just crushed. I was just crushed. Mm. And I, cause I, I believed in Michael so much. And then I said, well, I got to catch a flight back to Florida. And I stood up and he said, I've been lying to you. Oh boy. He goes, Michael Mordente never told me anything about Thelma Royston. The government came to me and made me an offer helped me out, got my girlfriend a visit with me, dropped her state charges. And they did all of these things for me to testify against Michael Mortente. I about passed out. I was like, holy shit. What? Oh my well, God. He tells you that right as you're about to leave. Yeah. Yeah. Wow. What do you think? What do you think made him? What do you think made him? Uh, I, I, think, I think I was just so beat down. I think uh -huh. he just, because I was devastated. I mean, I, yeah. I didn't cry, but I was just like, he, f he felt bad for you. I think he would. I think he realized that he, he just had a little bit of con like a little bit of consciousness, like, holy shit, what am I doing? Yeah. So I sat back down, I pulled out a legal pad and I hand wrote an affidavit. Wow. And I, and, and, and I, I write well, my degree's in English. And so I just, it's very natural to me. So I hand wrote an affidavit and then I looked around and I had no, I, I, I couldn't notarize it because I mean, although I was a notary, I wasn't a notary in another state. And so I had the Bureau of Prison guard, the correctional, you know, there, I had them witness it. And I, to this day will say, I levitated down those stairs with that affidavit, that handwritten affidavit. And I, you know, we didn't have cell phones then. We didn't have any. So I ran to a payphone and I called the office and I said, I just got, I just got a recantation from Horace Barnes. He explained to me how Karen Cox made all these promises and all this prosecutorial misconduct and all of this stuff. I'm getting on a flight. I'm bringing the affidavit home right now. And they said, don't you dare. And I said, what do you mean? And they said, I said, I'll go to Kinko. I'll go to, kinko's or fedex or wherever and i'll fax it to you and i'm bringing the original and they said no they said put the original in the fedex envelope and fax us a copy right now and i said no i'm flying home I'm, i'll bring it to you and they said no if your plane crashes you're the only one with an original really and i knew right then that was the first time and when i say coming of age in these cases that was uh -huh. the first time that i realized the cause in in these cases were so much more than me. Yeah. Like this was somebody's life. And they were like, hey, listen, if your plane crashes, you're the only one with the original and we need that. So you're and and so that was that was a very telling thing to me about how, yeah. how definitely the attorneys feel. Well, thank um, God your plane didn't crash. But so no, you so no, you I, so you mailed back the original though. You did mail back the yeah, original. Fed, I FedExed it back. Wow. I kept a copy and and faxed it. So that was one. That was an issue. Um, so this went on. We kept losing. We kept losing on appeal. Uh, we were uncovering all kinds of stuff. We uncovered the FBI lied in their testimony at trial when they claimed that the bullets came from a certain box of bullets that Gail had because um, the FBI testified that the metal urgy and those bullets were consistent from that box of bullets were consistent with the ones that they recovered from the crime scene and from Miss Royston. Well, thanks to Fred Whitehurst with the FBI and all of his whistleblowing and our own experts, we learned that that was the biggest bunch of bullshit that that guy testified to, it's it's like saying um, because you have all of these same ingredients, it's it's uh, a quesadilla. It's like Mexican food, you know. It's the same four ingredients, but it's prepared different ways. <laughs> well, that's the same way with this metallurgy. Just because there's metal and allergy, uh, you know, allergen and tin and some other you know component, that doesn't mean it's the same. 
it came from the same batch of bullets. So that was a huge thing. So then um, uh, we finally, after after so many years of getting told, deny, 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 you're losing, we don't care. This whole time, Michael's still screaming at me. We're still losing. Did and he have a, um, I'm sorry, did he have a, uh, like a death date? I don't know what they call that. Was he, there a- he did have a death warrant at one time, like right when they used to get to death row back then, they would get a death warrant, but that got kicked because we were going through the appellate process. Mm-hmm. Um, By the way, in Florida, how, you know, how long is it generally from when you are given a death warrant to when you're, or when you're convicted, I guess, to when you're actually put to death in the state of Florida? Is there like an average amount of time? I, there's experts that will give that, but I mean, I had a guy that had been on death row since 1972 and wow. we just get, got his life, his death sentence commuted. He'd mm-hmm. been on death row longer than I had been alive Jeez. at the time. It, and so, so it's it. There's some that are still there that have been there, you know, like that guy Ray Meeks from 1972. But we finally, finally got an evidentiary hearing, and I'll never forget it for obvious reasons. But Judge Chet Tharp uh, was the judge in Tampa, and he Tuesday, September. We started on Monday, September 10th, 2001. Tuesday uh, was September 11th, 2001. I remember we were all in court and a bailiff came in and said, your honor, um, the World Trade Center has been hit. And Judge Tharp said, well, we're not in New York. And, you know, the defense is insistent that Mr. Mordente get his day in court. So we're going forward. Wow. So we were all like, oh, Jesus, man, what's going on? It's just, you know, it's kind of a big deal. Well, then 30, 40 minutes later, um, a state attorney investigator came in and said, uh, went over to the government. Hence, and they said, listen, everybody that's in an airport's on their stomach. The <laughs> second World Trade Center has been hit. And <laughs> we, we believe America's under attack. So they snatch Michael up to take him back, you know, for security reasons, obviously they have to get him out of the courtroom. Nobody knew at the time what was going on. Uh Um, Michael, of course, is screaming. (laughs) It's my hearing. What do you mean? (laughs) I'm here for a hearing. I've waited. (laughs) You know, I mean, he is showing his ass and I'm like, I'll be at the jail. I'll come to the jail. I'll come to the jail. I'll explain everything as soon as I know. So Marty and I walked across the street. My phone at that time I had a cell phone. My phone started blowing up. Are you on a plane? Where are you? Because my people, my friends all knew I traveled a lot. Mm. And uh, we, Marty and I walked across the street to the federal courthouse, which thinking back was probably the stupidest thing since we were in Tampa near McDill Air Force Bay, um, mm. you know, because that's a comm center. So mm. we were like sitting ducks. And we, Marty and I, Marty was working in New York d- at the time. And we stood there and watched the World Trade Center um, buildings collapse. And I just remember Marty going, oh, my God, my friends, Mm. my friends. And so I thought, you know, of course it has to be Mordente's case. So, you know, there's just there's just been so many landmarks and so many things in this case that is it it is just, you know, been very emotional for us. Wow. And so the case got continued, obviously. Mm-hmm. So we come back a year or so later, finish the evidentiary hearing. We get denied. We go and we talk to John Trevina, who is a phenomenal trial attorney in Tampa. And we talk to John about this case. And John, of course, can only tell us so much because he's still under privilege, even though he represented Larry Royston. But privilege doesn't die doesn't die with the client he still dies you know he still has to protect the interest of the client so we learn and we had never known this before um we learn that when michael mordente and larry royston were arraigned in court together when they were charged you know when they were initially charged and they go to arraignment larry royston looks to john trevina 
when they bring Michael Mordente in and he goes, who, who the fuck is that? That's not who I hired. <laughs> so Trevina could never tell this ever. So we had this information that we, what could we do? So this, this trucks along, finally the Supreme court, the Florida Supreme court based on this immunity issue with Gail, she lies, lies, lies. They don't ever charge her. They even under use immunity, they never charge her. I've got a recantation from Horace Barnes. We know the FBI lied like with like liar, liar, pants on fire about their analysis of the bullets. We have prosecutorial misconduct and the Supreme Court says you're getting a new trial. Hmm. So in 2005, we had our first retrial with Michael Mordente. Hmm. That jury was hung. Wow. So we do another trial. So what's important about that is that by this time, I'm a wife mm -hmm. and I'm a new mother. Mm -hmm. And I'm still here, me and Mike are going back to court, him yeah. screaming at me all the way. Well, let me ask you this. Did you, from the get-go, did you believe in this guy's innocence? I did. Yeah. I did. But, you know, it was like, because... Because there were certain things that he said that gave it all the credibility in the world. First of all, I, I, the alibi was phenomenal. I thought it was bulletproof. It just wasn't presented well. And it just, you know, you just had a very skilled prosecutor that just un, unrung the alibi. So it didn't, you know, it just never, it just always kind of fell flat. But I really believed him because I'm like, who, what woman's going to testify that, yeah, I was in a sling and I had sex under a overpass and it was spaghetti night at Shoney's. I mean, like who, yeah. who's going to put themselves out there like that? If that's well, did, you, the, did you have any idea who did it then? Did you have a, like, an Oh, open? I think I know. I think I know who did it. Um, okay. I think it was Gail's boyfriend who was also named Mike at the time. And mm -hmm. she ended up marrying him. And I think that was for spousal, uh, uh, spousal privilege. Wow. Okay. All right. Um, so the first, so the first trial ends, uh, it's a hung trial. Yes. Hung jury. Okay. Yes. And then, uh, you guys go back to trial or what? Yeah. Oh, sorry. So we, um, so because it's a hung jury, we get another trial. The second trial, they convict him of second. No, they convict him. They convict him, but the government's not seeking life. Gets sent back for a third trial. This whole time we're fighting this issue about being allowed to bring in the information about Trevina. So it's either the third or fourth trial. I can't remember. Well, hold on a sec. He's convicted in the second trial. So why is there a third and fourth trial? We went on appeal. Okay. Appeal he gets oh. life the second trial uh -huh. we come back on a third now you have to understand every every one of these trials madeline has learned how to walk yeah and i wasn't there because these trials are in tampa yes, and your these, daughter. yeah and these trials are you know weeks weeks and that doesn't include all the prep of getting the witnesses there and so i missed her first steps her first words and so mm. it was just um man it was just a it was taking its toll. So yeah. finally, we're coming back for either the third or fourth trial. I just can't remember. I want to say it was the fourth trial. And uh, we finally get a ruling that John Trevina is going to be able to testify mm -hmm. that um, Larry Royston said, that's not the guy we hired. And I think the government at that point knew they probably weren't going to be able to get past that hurdle. And so they offered us second degree time served because he'd already wow. done like how uh, how unusual it. is it to get this many shots like this many cracks at it it's, this is very unusual isn't it no i mean had they had they done it right the first time 
Mm -hmm. and given him a trial early on, I mean, it would have been, um, you know, I think this would have been resolved years, years earlier, but you know, the state court didn't think what Karen Cox did was prosecutorial misconduct, which is fine, you know, and then, you know, it goes to a higher court and then, you know, we, this had to keep going up and down the ladder in the court system. You know, we have five, five courts that we go to on a death penalty case going all the way up to the United States Supreme Court. And there were all of these hiccups along the way. They were, uh, we had learned that they had withheld evidence. You know, I talked about the alibi. I talked about promising the snitch stuff. I mean, so there were all these developments that we were continuously developing, learning, adding to. And so that was all big stuff. So finally we kept, we were coming down to the last trial and they, and the government made this offer. And I remember Terry Bacchus and I sitting in the Orient Road jail in Hillsborough County. And I said, please, Mike, please, this is your chance to come home and get out. And he basically was like, fuck you. I'm not doing this. I'm clearing my name. I'm walking out of that courtroom, an innocent man. I didn't do this. Wow. And we had had just really deep, long conversations. I mean, at that point, I'd probably been with him 13 years. Mm -hmm. And um, and I said, Michael, if you had a pilot's license, you were out on bond. Why the hell didn't you leave? <laughs> you know, like. Well, he's an innocent man. That's like. That's I what guess. he said. That's what yeah. he said. He goes leave why would i leave i didn't do anything wrong right. i i didn't kill this lady and right. so um so there were some really emotional deep conversations that michael and i had and i you know i pulled every every card i knew and i said i just don't know if i can keep doing this mm -hmm. if they convict you again no one has ever listened to us you keep getting convicted. This may be our only chance. And if we go to trial and it and the Trevina stuff comes out that Royston said he didn't know you and didn't hire you and had no idea who you were and you get convicted, we're dead in the water. We have exhausted every possible thing in this case. And you're getting life and you're never coming home. <laughs> and uh, he agreed. He agreed, and uh, I, I was standing there when he walked out. When he wow. walked to me, and he said, um, he came straight to me, and he hugged me, and he said, these are the first steps I've taken in 25 years without shackles, or 17 years without shackles. Wow. And it, was, it was huge. And what? that's 2008, did you say? Yes. So by that and time, Madeline was four. And um, that was that was huge. It had been such a long journey, you know. Wow. Um, so where is uh, Michael Mordente today? Is he yelling at someone right now? I should set I'm this sure. guy up. He still yells at me. Uh, he's in Alaska. He had a Alaska. Yeah, he had a phenomenal pen pal that that stood by him. And um, he, they always said, if he ever gets out, he can come to Alaska. And I'll, I'll never forget. Um, he walked is out. A, is this a lady friend or a guy? No, no, a lady friend. A lady okay. Friend. <laughs> Mike Curious. was quite, Mike was quite the ladies' man. All right. Um, still is, I'm sure. So I remember when I was turning forty, mm -hmm. um, my husband said, "What do you, you know? What do you want for your fortieth birthday?" I was like, you know. I really just would like to, you know, see Mike, talk to Mike. Mm. I haven't talked to him in a while. So Grady went through my phone one night and found Mike's number and called him and said, Hey, I'm having this big party, surprise party for Monica's birthday. And the only thing she's really asked of, she doesn't even know there's a party. The only thing she's asked of is for you, you know, to see you. And he goes, I'll fly you in. I'll put you up. I'll pay for everything you need just so she can see you when she walks into this party. Wow. And Michael said, um, I would do anything in the world for her, but I will never step foot in Florida again. Interesting.
So, um, yeah, can't so, blame the guy there. No, of course. So, so he says, but I'll make a video. So he made a video on like his <laughs> flip phone and it was just like, and they played it at the party and it was really, really good. But Michael has come to Florida since then. And I have seen him. And in fact, that's a picture of Michael Mordente out in Alaska with the fish he caught. Wow. And is he still with this woman, this new woman? You don't know. They, 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 no, I think she just recently passed. As, oh. um, and so, I, so, but they were together for years. I mean, he's been out since, you know, 2008. And he's the last I heard. I, did, I missed a call from him a couple of weeks ago. And he's just, you know, he's doing great. He's. And whatever happened to Gail? So Larry kills himself. That's the original guy. Yeah. Uh, that, and, and they killed Thelma, Larry's wife. But Gail's the one that that pointed the finger, right? Gail, Gail yeah. was. And she was the one that orchestrated. She was the one that orchestrated the murder for hire. And I was always so frustrated and aggravated in this case that she never spent a day in jail. And I'm like, you not only were sleeping with this married man. Mm -hmm. Um. And 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 set up the murder of this poor woman. I mean, just horrible, just horrible situation. And and then fingered your old, your fingered your ex husband as as the trigger man. Which you know, the one thing if you knew Mike, Mike, Mike loved Gail when they were together. Don't get me wrong, but we laugh about this in the Adelson case, and not in a laugh. Anyway. But not because it's ironic. Uh, how in the world does Katie get her baby daddy to commit a murder for her? And there's some similarities here because I'm like, how did you? How would? How did Gail? How would Gail get her ex husband to go commit a murder for her, for her boyfriend? I mean, like that just doesn't make sense to me. Yeah, where is she? Is she still alive, Gail? Yeah. Well, the last I heard, I haven't. You know, I I put every voodoo. Bad karma, <laughs> mean potion. If I could just <laughs> pluck a hair off her head and get a fingernail clipping, I'm sure I could really do some damage. And but how old I'm, is how old's Michael now? How old is he? Oh gosh, I think he was 67 when he got out. So that's 2007. What's like and that was 08. Yeah, how many years is that? 15 <laughs> years. So he's. 78 80 something wow yeah, i mean he looks i mean he looks great he's yeah so let me ask you this what is yeah. your uh what's what's the moral of the story because it sounds like uh you are very tenacious and sometimes the justice system can be screwy what's what's your moral of the story to just keep you appealing and keep at it you can't give up when you have these kind of facts and, and the more you investigate, the more you uncover, because this was not going to be a penalty phase case. This was a Michael Mordente is what we call in our industry back when we had the electric chair, a free me or fry me. You were either mm. going to let me go or you were going to kill. Me. And um, in, in this case, I never. We just kept fighting. And that's the that's the issue in criminal defense that people don't understand. It's like. You, um, we would, we would lose in state court and we were like, but the government cheated mm -hmm. and the snitch admitted he lied and the FBI expert witness lied and the science is junk science. And this is, and you were just like, that was the hardest part for me. And that's why I'm saying it was such a coming of age because when you're when you're 22, 23, and you're so idyllic, and everything is so like, oh, it's the justice system. The government doesn't cheat. The cops don't lie. That you know, and then you're like seeing this for the first time. You're like, he's in us. He didn't do this. Like he could be a bad businessman, and he is a, you know, he wants to have a lot of sex with different people. But th there's a big difference between being maybe of poor moral character and being a killer. Yeah. And it was just hard. And, you know, I mean, Pam Bondi ended up, who later became our attorney general, she was ended up being a, the, the trial attorney, one of the trial attorneys in, in these trials. And she was ultimately the one that 
you know, allowed us to do this deal. So, you know, although she was a very good adversary when she was working for the government, she 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 saw that they had some problems too with their case at the end once the Trevina stuff came out. But what what pissed me off about that is that the government knew all along that Trevina, that Larry Royston had told his lawyer that Mordente wasn't the guy. And so they knew they knew that all along and, yeah. and kept it's it so, from us. It's crazy because it does become about, it's almost like politics in a way. It's just about winning or losing. It's not really yeah. about the issues yeah. at hand, you know, so yeah. uh, it's crazy. But this ladies and gentlemen, is why Monica Jordan is not only a badass, but also the president of Jordan Research and Consulting, one of the nation's most sought after private investigators. As you just heard, she's handled more than 50 death penalty trials. She worked with Michael Mordente, but she also worked with Eileen Warnos' post-conviction team. That is the infamous serial killer. They made the movie uh, Monster with Charlize Theron uh, based off of her. Monica, thank you so much for joining us. Appreciate it. Thank Thanks you. for having me. Love you, America. This was Surviving My Biggest Case. Everybody.